Hello and welcome to exercise number nine of the reinforcement learning lecture. This is Max speaking and today's topic will be function approximators for the prediction of the value function. In the past we have made use of tabular methods to store data and access for example our estimates of the value function, but tabular methods are inefficient or not even applicable for some scenarios. If the problem space is discrete but very large we will need a lot of storage capacity and when the problem state is continuous, tabular methods can't be used at all. That's why we needed a discretization routine in the past two exercises. Moreover, tabular methods are unable to generalize. Every update to the table will only change the information that we stored about one specific state, although very similar conditions would apply to the states in the direct proximity. We can overcome these issues by making use of function approximators. For this exercise we will look at the mountain car environment from Jim. This environment has a continuous state space which consists of the position and the velocity of the car, as can be seen in this animation. The action space of the mountain car is discrete and gives us three options. We can either accelerate to the right, to the left or we can do nothing. This environment is somewhat similar to the inverted pendulum because a good policy also has to be able to perform a swing up here. The car cannot accelerate all the way to the finish line on its own, but it needs to build up energy first. Reaching the finish line will terminate the environment and up to termination every time step will result in a reward of minus one. So it's best to reach the finish line as fast as possible. For this exercise we will focus on value prediction within this environment and the control of this environment will follow in the upcoming exercise. If you have participated in the past exercises, you should have a gym already installed. For this exercise, TensorFlow is also needed, so make sure that it's installed as well. When testing the environment, you should be able to see a window in which the car performs some random actions. Now this should be enough about the preparation for this exercise, so let's have a look at task number one. In the first task we want to find a linear approximation of the value function that is able to estimate the value based on features that are derived from the state vector. For this we need to write a feature function that will calculate the features based on the state vector and moreover we want to write a training algorithm that is based on the semi-gradient TD0 algorithm in order to be able to learn the parameter vector w. For the feature function we need to ensure that the condition holds that the feature function will give back a zero vector as soon as the terminal state of the environment is reached, which is the case if we are behind the finish line and this is if the position is greater than 0.5. Feel free to use whichever features come to your mind but um, also try to make use of features that somehow implement the energy of the system. The energy of our mountain car of course consists of the kinetic energy which is proportional to the velocity squared which is rather easy to calculate but also of the potential energy and the potential energy is of course proportional to the height of the car so in order to calculate the height of the car we would need to know how the relation between position and height works in this environment and this is why we included this link in this task. So let's have a look at the source code first and if you dive into it a little bit you see that here is a height function defined and within this height function you see that the height of the car is an affine transformation of the third multiple of the position xs is the position coordinate here. So this is surely a feature that we want to implement. Moreover we probably want to be able to map a static offset. So we need at least one static regressor. So we want to use one static regressor. And if we have a look at the step function over here, we see that the velocity update consists of the inhomogeneous part of course, which is the action that we apply and of one homogeneous part, as can be seen here, and this homogeneous part is proportional to the third multiple of the position as well, but this time it's the cosine, and here for the height it is the sine, so maybe we can use both of them, or at least try out 
each of them. So from look, looking at this code, we gain some knowledge about the features we could be expecting to be expedient in this case. That's a good initial point to start our investigation. But at first, let's also have a look at the policy that we are analyzing. The policy is defined here in this code cell. It's a very simple policy and by far not the optimal one. And it mainly says that as soon as the car is unable to accelerate any further and the environment and the slope of the environment slows it down, then the car is accelerated in the opposite direction so that the energy in the system is increased. Let's have a look at this. I run this policy a little bit and we see the car is accelerating in one direction then in the opposite direction until it reaches the finish line. Now let's come back to our feature definition. We see that the state vector has two entries which are the position and the velocity and here I can now define the features that I want to use. As I said, I want to use a static feature, which is uh, for a static offset that we can calculate then within the parameter vector. Then we can use the raw state, so just the position and the velocity itself. Then to take into account the kinetic energy, we will use velocity squared and the kinetic energy is proportional to that. And then further the sine of the third multiple of the position which is proportional or an affine transformation uh, of the height and moreover a cosine so that we can also take into account the acceleration that happens by gravity. Last but not least we also have to take into account that if we reach the terminal state then the feature vector should be equal to zero. So this is why I set a flag here. Flag is named win. And if the position is greater than 0 0.5, we cross the finish line. So win is true. We set this win flag to 1. And here I multiply everything by 1 minus win. So if we are behind the finish line, then everything will be set to 0 and else we will use the normal features. You could say this is somewhat similar to one hot encoding. Like in the past two exercises, I will not talk about the code very much. You are probably even faster at understanding it if you read it yourself. So I don't want to waste your time by explaining it line by line. Let's just have a look at the most important points. The error is calculated via the use of bootstrapping. So we plug in the next value here, which is only an estimation. And moreover, then the update to the parameter vector then consists of alpha times the error times the feature state. The structure of this gradient update is something that is quite common in gradient-based learning. In most cases, you will have this gradient update consist of the step size, then the linear error. You see it's not the squared error or the mean squared error even, it's just the linear error for this step in this case. And um, then the input variable, which is the feature state in this case. After running this algorithm, we get a collection of parameters here that are stored in the w parameter vector. So we see that something was calculated here, but of course we need to have a look at the result to see if this is a useful result or not. In order to check whether our value function approximator works correctly, we should check its performance on the whole state space. I did this here in the form of a color map. So let's have a look at this and investigate this color map a little bit. On the x-axis we see the position. So on the far right here is the goal line. So the yellow area should have the highest value. And if we look at the color bar here on the right, we see that this is actually the case. So the goal line is identified here by the yellow um, area. And um, yeah, the y-axis denotes the velocity. So in the upper half, we have a positive velocity. So we are uh, going to the right. And in the lower half, we have negative velocity. So we are going to the left. In the area right in front of the finish line, the color gets lighter. 
So this makes sense because if we are moving towards the finish line, then we would expect our chances to go up. So the value rises in this direction and our value is the lowest around the middle because from here it takes the longest to build up the speed. In some regions, however, this does not make sense. For example, over here where we are quite near to the goal line, but um, we also build up negative velocity. So we are standing here and are going to the left. So we are actually going away from the finish line. Um, so accordingly, the value should be quite low here and not as bright as it is depicted here. But of course, since we are using a linear function approximator with a limited amount of features or a limited amount of information, um, it is quite possible that the features we use do not contain the information that would be needed to identify that this area here is not an expedient area in order to go to the finish line. So the linear function approximator with hand-tuned features might just not be good enough in this case to be able to distinguish this area from this area. Of course, this color map is not the only possible way you could view the performance of your estimator. You could also have a look at it in a 3D surface plot like this, for example. And um, yeah, here you can see a little bit differently how the estimation works. In this depiction, we see that it is quite a step from the state right before the finish line to the state behind the finish line. And yeah, physically, this does not quite make sense, but we can also give the fault of this to the linear estimator. I think it's just not good enough to depict it better. Normally, we would expect the transition from before the finish line to the points behind the finish line to be continuous, but here it really looks to be yeah, a step function. As I already said, this area here should not have such high values. It should have quite low values. And moreover, here we can see that the value rises over here. So if you start in the middle, this is the starting position, and you go to the left at first, then the value rises. And also, also for this, there's no obvious reason why this should be the case. If we use a discount factor lower than 1 and we use 0 0.9 in this case, then you should not be able to see that the finish line is approaching already if you are just started out here. So the value at this point should not be so much different from the value at this point. But yeah, yet again, this is a problem of the function approximator here. In the next diagram, I also plotted the visited states into our color map. So here we can clearly see which path our policy will follow. The initial state is on this line, so small interval of positions that are valid as initial state and the velocity in the initial state is always zero. Our policy will then guide the car to accelerate to the left at first, so negative velocity, negative position, accelerating to the left. Then as the car cannot accelerate any further, it will change directions and accelerate in the opposite direction. So then we are accelerating to the right and if our starting position allows it, then we are now able to go to the finish line already. These are these curves that yeah, visit the finish line then directly. But there are also a lot of curves that are not able to build enough velocity to go to the finish line already, but that need to take another turn. So they turn again. At this point, they are not able to accelerate any further to the right. So then they are accelerating to the left again, and that's what they are doing on this path here. And yeah, here on the left, you can see that they are bumping into the wall. This is a very obvious reason why this policy is not optimal, because this shouldn't happen if your policy was optimal. The energy of the car is then given into the wall, so the kinetic energy of the car is lost and only the potential energy is kept. So you see that the line ends here and the car has zero velocity then. And so the car will need to start over, um, of course, now from a mountaintop. So we have a lot of potential ener energy to start with, but the velocity has to be built up from there. So yeah, 
need to accelerate again to the right and then can go to the finish line in one go here. So in this picture we can see that there are a lot of areas in this state space that we did not even visit, so states that we did not see, for example in the bottom right corner. And yeah, this could also of course be a reason why we do not make a correct estimate of these states because we did not see them. And the states that we see allow for an extrapolation to this state, which um, yeah is not correct given the reality of our environment, but which is still able to provide us with quite good evaluations of the state space that we visited according to this trajectories here. Another issue of this function approximator can be seen he over here where the trajectories fork into two groups. The upper group consists of the trajectories that go to the finish line directly and for this group of trajectories it makes sense that the value function gets better when going to the finish line but for the other group we nearly have the same color here, so nearly the same evaluation, but of course we see that, um, for example, uh, over here, the trajectory will not go to the finish line directly, will, but will take another turn around the state space, so the color over here should be much darker, it should be a much worse evaluation here. So the evaluation according to our function approximator makes no sense over here, it's not correct, but it's the best we could acquire with our linear methods and the features we chose. That's it with the first task. Now let's have a look at task number two. In this task we also want to find a linear function approximator, but the method to acquire it will this time be recursive least squares temporal difference learning. Unlike the semi-gradient temporal difference learning, we this time do not need a learning rate and our parameter vector will always be optimally fitted to the experiences we collected because this is a recursive least squares method. RLS algorithms always have a forgetting factor, in this case we call it lambda, and lambda will define how much focus we will set on the new experiences in contrast to the older experiences. If the forgetting factor is high, we will not forget, so if we set it to 1, then we will take everything into account on an equal level or with an equal weighting. And if the forgetting factor is very low, then we will forget older experiences and take newer experiences more into account. This could be helpful if our environment would be time variant. In this case it's not but still we want to check for different values of lambda so that we can see if the algorithm is stable and not diverging. The feature vector that we defined in task number one will be reused here, but also make sure that the same condition applies for the terminal state, so in this case as well we will need to define the vector such that it returns zero as soon as we are in the terminal state. And as you can see, it's the same here. I didn't change it for my presentation here. And yeah, this part contains a normalization of the state vector or the feature vector, and we will have a look at that in a minute. So let's start with the same feature vector as before. The algorithm can be seen here. Again, I will not talk so much about the code, but you see that here I used the add operator which implements the matrix multiplication and yeah, I hope it's easier to read that way. Just make sure that you understand that the add operator is the same as the numpy matmul operation. As you can see here, we have a division by our forgetting factor, so if we make the forgetting factor smaller, then this means that we have a gain factor in here, so the this p matrix will get larger and larger and this could bring this algorithm to diverge, but in many cases it will not diverge. Let's have a look at the results. For lambda equal to 1, we see that this color map and also the surface map looks very similar to the one that we got in task number 1, 
but I think that the step here to the finish line looks a little bit smaller. So I think uh, we maybe got a little bit better. The value estimation near to the finish line is probably a little bit better, but yeah, in essence, it should be very similar. Let's now try a different forgetting factor, 0 0.9. For this forgetting factor, we see that our received parameter vector has a very different value range now, especially these two parameters get rather large now. This parameter belongs to the velocity and the velocity is only defined on a on an interval between minus 0.07 to plus 0.07. So it's a very small interval. And yeah, it makes sense that the parameter has to rise to compensate for this. And yeah, the same applies to this parameter. This is the parameter for the velocity squared. So of course it has to be even bigger than this one. When looking at the corresponding surface plot, we see that for the states with higher velocity, the value is now higher than in the rest of the state space. And this of course makes sense because our chances of reaching the finish line arise if our velocity is high. So you could say that this is a somewhat better estimation of the value function. However, some problems still are, um, are the same, uh, like in this area where we are accelerating away from the finish line and yet still the value is very high here. The parameters getting very large is often a problem of overfitting. So this is something you would normally want to avoid. This is why I implemented also a normalization function here for our feature vector. This normalization function will perform a min-max normalization and this will make the features stay in an interval between minus one and one. So let's have a look at this. I run it again. Now we see that the parameters are in a much more feasible re value range. An issue that I came across during the construction of this task is the definition of the right feature vector. So as we have seen, this feature vector works and we can find quite good solutions with it. But if we use a feature vector that is blown up, so if we use too many features, then this could be counterproductive for our estimation. So to demonstrate this case, I will now extend this feature vector by some generic features. For example, we already have the velocity squared. We could also use the position squared or a multiplication of position and velocity. And of course, this could also happen in arbitrary combinations, now position squared and this multiplied with velocity or position times velocity squared, or both of them squared and multiplied. And of course, we could also use sine and cosine of the third harmonic of the velocity. Yeah, and this of course will blow up the feature vector. And yeah, you would think that this gives us more information to work with in the state space or about the state space, but in the end, the result will suffer from this. I will now run the prediction again with this definition and here you see the result. So this didn't work, the algorithm got unstable and diverged and in the end we didn't get a usable parameter vector to work with. If I set our forgetting factor to 1 again now, we can try it again. As you can see, this time it worked better, but you can also see that some of the parameters get very low values here and this means that the features that correspond to these parameters are not very usable for the task we are trying to solve. In most cases you are well advised to make use of the expert knowledge that is available available to you so that you don't have to use such generic features to try to squeeze out the relevant information out of the problem space. I hope this was a useful takeaway message. So now let's get over to task number three. In task one and two, we made use of the linear function approximators that 
work with features. Now we will work with nonlinear non -linear function approximators in the form of artificial neural networks. You don't have to write a lot of code here. In essence, you only need to write the normalized function, as we can see here, because artificial neural networks tend to learn slower if the input and output has to get arbitrarily large and yeah, as the state vector is defined on very different intervals, as we can see here, one very small and one bigger interval of numbers, it is expedient to bring these states into the same value range before we apply them to the neural network. And this is what you need to achieve in this normalized, um, normalized function in the form of a min-max transformation which can be seen here. So it's not a lot of code that you have to write yourself here. And also we will not make use of features here. We will just use the states as they come out of the environment. Of course, I would usually ask to give the units of this physical sizes as seen here, but in this time I didn't make use of the units because the mountain car is defined on a weirdly normalized state space. I don't quite know to what variables they normalize this state space, but if you have a look at the source file, you see, for example, that the gravity of this uh, mountain kind environment is very low, so I don't really know if it makes sense to put units here. It looks like this car drives on Pluto or something. The learning algorithm is already given here, and it's written with the use of TensorFlow. That's why we needed to install it in the beginning of the exercise. And yeah, because TensorFlow is not that trivial and moreover its use cases are different in the realm of reinforcement learning than in the domain of supervised learning, I will use this task as an obsession to tell you a little bit about the use of TensorFlow in reinforcement learning and how it is applied in this task. So let's have a look at the code of the algorithm here. In the setup, you can see that here a model of an artificial neural network is defined. This is achieved by making use of the sequential class from TensorFlow Keras to define a model. So the model will then contain the artificial neural network, ANN. And yeah, then after defining the model at first, we are now able to add layers to it. So at first, we add a dense layer. So this is just an affine linear transformation, this dense layer, and after this affine linear transformation, it follows an activation function, which is in this case the nonlinear ReLU function. ReLU stands for Rectified Linear Unit, and the diagram of the ReLU function can be seen here. So as you can see, for positive input, the ReLU function gives out an identity, and for negative input, the ReLU function just gives out a zero. Although this function is linear for positive inputs, it's still considered a nonlinear function because, of course, it's not linear for negative inputs. It's important to have these nonlinear functions within our ANN because if we would use linear activation here, then we would only have the affine linear transformation that is implemented with a dense layer, and so in the end, everything would be linear in this network as well, so we would have no gain of using artificial neural networks over the linear methods that we have seen in task 1 and 2. So that's why we need to use nonlinear activation functions. The last layer of our network is the output layer, and it only consists of one neuron, because we only need to estimate one value with it, and the activation function for this output layer is linear because the linear activation will not implement any constraints concerning our value range. So we do not know in which range our values might lay in the end. So it's good to not implement any constraints constraints to them. So the linear activation is best used in this case for the output function. The network itself is just a feedforward network and we have two layers of 16 and 16 neurons. So it's not too deep of a neural network and should be quite 
good to use. It should not take too long to train it. We also need to define an optimizer. In this case, our optimizer will be SGD, so Stochastic Gradient Descent. That already came up in the lecture. And we also need to define its learning rate and consistent to the methods we used up to today. We will also call the learning rate alpha if we use neural network. Of course, in order to be able to optimize something, we also need to define the cost function that we want to look at. And this is done here. We will be looking at the mean squared error because the function that we try to minimize is the value error, the squared value error, I should say. And this has to be a TensorFlow object. We cannot just write um, some NumPy equation or something here because this function has to be differentiable in the way of TensorFlow tensors. And that's why we also need to get this function defined by TensorFlow first. That's it for the setup. Now let's dive into the code that runs during runtime. Up to this line, the code is not new, but in this line, we see that the model that we defined in the setup is used to calculate or to estimate the next value. We see that we just plug in here the normalized next state and um, yeah, we get the next value out of it. Sometimes you need to adjust a little bit because um, TensorFlow Keras wants to have specific number of dimensions within their I.O. So sometimes you have to wrap up uh, a new dimension around your inputs and outputs. But yeah, we can directly apply the already normalized features and yeah, just put them into the model and the model will then propagate them through the neural network and give us our value estimation. With this value estimation, we can then make the estimation of the target. So we can compute the bootstrap target. Here you see a distinction between the case um, if the environment is done or not. If we are not done, we calculate the target uh, just as usual, but if we are done, then we just use the reward as our target and not the future, not the discounted future value. In the previous tasks, we always defined that for the terminal state, the feature vector has to be equal to zero. And this distinction here implements kind of the same dynamics. So if we reach the target state, we only use the immediate reward. And if we do not reach the, reach the terminal state, then we are also allowed to use the future value here. So now that we have a target, we can compute the loss or the prediction error. So it's it's quite the same as in the task before, but we have to do it differently now because we are now using the network model. In the new versions of TensorFlow, this works per the gradient tape class. In older versions of TensorFlow, you had the network model compiled in beforehand. And then when you were using the network model, you were unable to look into it. So this was not too easy to debug because you were unable to yeah, see the values inside of the network in hindsight. This is why in the newer versions of TensorFlow, the gradient tape was implemented. And this now allows to debug the network a little bit better. Um, it's named gradient tape because now you have the values on tape, so they are recorded in some way, and you can use this gradient tape to look at the values yeah, after computations, but it also allows us to directly implement the calculations that we need. And this is what is done here. So we calculate one prediction. This is the same as this line, just not for the next state, but for the now state, so to say. And then we also need to calculate the loss, which is the prediction error. error. We previously defined the mean squared error. And here we are using it with the target as one input and the prediction as the other input, such that the error between prediction and target has to be minimized. Now that we've defined the loss within the gradient tape, we can e make easy use of it to calculate the actual gradients. We can now use the gradient tape object that we defined and calculate the gradient of the loss concerning the trainable variables. And these trainable variables are the weights of the model. 
so we do not need to calculate the gradient by hand but um, yeah this function does it for us and then the gradient is in this variable you could then change the gradients if you need to for example for some methods it's interesting to look at the length of the gradients or the absolute value so such that the update is not too large and then you could for example clip the gradients but in this case we won't do that we just apply them directly so we now use the optimizer object that we previously defined and then the apply gradients function so what we are saying here is that for every trainable weight that we have within our model we just want to add the according gradient so this is already it we are now able to perform a learning algorithm on this neural network value estimation model and yeah you see or maybe if you are familiar with supervised learning then this routine looks quite a little bit different to it this is because in reinforcement learning we often want to update the model in every step and that's what we are doing here so we want an implementation that is fast for small amounts of data so we are just plugging in one state vector for example and so this function is the fastest to compute small amounts of predictions and also this is uh, very fast for computing small amounts of gradients in supervised learning however you will do that a little bit different there you often have all the needed data in beforehand so you do not want to update your model in every step but you update the model at once with all the data that is available to you so you want functions that work with, with uh, large amounts of data and are optimized for them and this is most uh, for most cases not this uh, solution but then you would rather use the fit and the predict function Let's now see if we can get a good result here. I will start to run the learning algorithm. And you see that this learning, of course, takes quite some time longer than our linear functions or lin our linear approximators. But uh, yeah, the function approximator of a neural network is, of course, also more powerful. So let's see how good the result turns out. While the training loop is still running, let's have another short look on the network definition. So we see that we have two nonlinear layers and one linear layer. So if we look at them separately, you could say that this linear layer, of course, is still a linear estimator. Um, and yeah, in that fashion, it's the same as the linear estimators that you used in task one and two in this exercise. And as we have seen in task one and two, we need good features to make use of this linear function approximator. You could interpret it that way, that the nonlinear layers that are defined here are the ones that extract the features from the states. You, you remember that we didn't use any feature engineering. We are just putting in the raw states. So the feature engineering is somewhat done by the network itself. And then after the nonlinear layers, the last layer is a linear layer and this one will then profit from the feature engineering that is learned within the network. Of course, this doesn't mean that proper feature engineering from outside would be useless, but you see that in this cases it sometimes is not even necessary. The network is now done with learning, so let's have a look at the results. When having a look at our color map at first, we see that it looks similar to the one in task one and two in some places, but it looks also a little bit different in other places. One place that I highlighted in a previous task was um, this one here, where the trajectory forks into one group that goes to the finish line directly and one group that doesn't, that has to perform another turn around the state space. And here you see that the group that goes to the finish line directly now gets underlined with a better value and here the value is worse. So now you could say that this function approximator was able to, uh, to see this difference and yeah, it was able to evaluate these states a little bit more accurate. Still, we have no state visits to states down here. So of course, this is still an extrapolation and we cannot be sure that this is correct 
representation. But anyway, we see that this region got a little bit darker than this uh, region, and this was not the case in the previous tasks. When looking at the surface plot for this scenario, we see that it looks far better than before. We see that the region down here that is yeah, far away from the finish line has a very low value and minus 10 is the worst value we could achieve with the discount factor of 0 0.9 that we used here. So it makes sense that all these points have the lowest value in the end. And we also see that the slope here starts out a little earlier than the slope here. So we are here in a higher value position than here. And this makes also sense because of course we have a higher velocity here and that's why we will take less time to go to the finish line from here than from here. Throughout this exercise we've looked at the discount factors of 0.9 but now we are also able to have a look at the discount factor of uh, 1. That's because in this problem we are going episodically and the problem is safe to terminate at some point and that's why our return that we collect has an upper bound. So there is no danger of divergence and that's why we also can use the discount factor of 1. However, this will make the problem a little bit harder and in order to make our neural network ready to deal with it, we also need to reduce our learning rate a little bit and maybe add a few episodes. And then we are able to also train this model and have another look at what happens if the discount factor is a little higher. After training of this new setup now, we see that the color map looks a lot different than before. We see that the value range is very different than before, that we are going now down to a value of minus 120, which is probably the number of time steps we usually need to go to the finish line. We now see that the initial state has the lowest rating, the no lowest evaluation from all the states in the state space, which also makes sense because even here we have a higher energy than here, although we are going to the left side. And of course, it makes sense that this state is rated better than this state if our discount factor is higher now. But yeah, we also see that now this corner has the highest value of the whole state space, which is even in the positive, positive value range. And of course, this is not possible. There is no positive value within this scenario. So we could name this an extrapolation error probably. Also, when having a look at the surface plot, it looks more interesting. We now see that the swing up happens in kind of a spiral through the state space. And this probably fits to the expectation we would have to this scenario. But of course, also here we see that this high value for such a bad state uh, could not be realistic. So also the extrapolation error is visible here. I think that's it for exercise number nine. Thank you for listening. And yeah, see you in the next video. Bye.